ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of uh, Expert Network series. Today, we're very excited to be discussing a commodity that perhaps uh, doesn't get as much spotlight as it should. Uh, everybody these days is talking about oil, gold, um, not much news about uranium. However, uh, from March 12th, which is around the, the peak of the sell-off to date, uranium prices are up 54%. Um, and year over year, they're actually up 4%. So I want to start with uh, Sid Rajiv, our head of research at Fundamental Research Corp, as well as Roger Lemaitre. He is the president and CEO of UEX Corporation, which is a cobalt and uranium exploration and development company. They actually have one of the largest land packages held uh, by a junior in the Athabasca Basin. So we're glad to have Roger here with us. But let's start with you, Sid. Um, why have uranium prices performed so well and what's driving this? Yeah, thank you, Brian. So for sure. So as you mentioned, uh, uranium prices have picked up uh, significantly in the past one month. The current price of uranium is approximately $32.5 a pound. The last time we saw such a pricing was back in 2016, so four years ago. Um, Cameco, the second largest producer of uranium in the world, the share price of Cameco is up 80%. UEX's share price is up 150%. Um, the price movement of UEX is a combination of both uranium prices as well as company-specific information. They came out with an updated resource estimate of their cobalt nickel recovery. I guess uh, Roger will talk about that much later in this um, discussion. But uh, going back to your question, Brian, so why we are seeing a massive increase in uh, commodity price in the last month is because of a huge supply disruption across the globe. So to put things in perspective, the global uranium production, uh, annual production is about 120, 130 million pounds of uh, uranium. Uh, and it's split 40% from Kazakhstan, 20% uh, from Africa, 15% each from Australia and Canada, the remaining 10% you're getting from China and Russia. Uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, hit us, Kazakhstan came out and said they're going to cut their production by approximately 15-20%. That equates to about 8% of the global supply. Canada, um, Amico controls 100% of Canada's production, came out and 100% they temporarily shut down their operation. Most of Africa's production is temporarily shut down. You're looking at 100% shutdown of approximately 25% of the global supply now. And the remaining 74%, we're going to see cuts in some, uh, production due to this pandemic. So if we assume that the shutdown will be about for three months, we're looking at a 20-25% cut in supply or production in this year. Now going back to the, dem going to the demand side of things, uh, uranium is used for electricity. And that's powering over 400 nuclear reactors in the world, uh, half of which come from Europe and the US. And they are importing most of their uh, consumption of uranium. And uh, obviously, the electric electricity consumption is going to decline because of the pandemic. Uh, the US EIA, which is the Energy Information Administration, came out and said that they expect electricity consumption to decline by 3% this year. Now compare that 3% to the 20-25% decline in supply. That's why we are seeing a massive increase in uranium prices in the last one month. So that's a very interesting um, topic because what you're seeing in other commodities, like oil, for example, is a complete collapse in demand um, from less cars, less airlines. With uranium, you're not seeing that type of demand collapse. Um, and then you're seeing the supply side reduction. So, Roger, why don't you tell us from your perspective, um, is that what you're seeing as well? And what, what is your outlook um, beyond COVID for uranium? Well, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Well, there's going to be less electricity demand. It also comes down to where the demand is coming from and what portion of the electricity sector. So while we see electricity demand dropping, uh, you're seeing nuclear power plants continuing to operate through the pandemic because they, they generate base load electricity. And while we're all at home, it's not the sort of cheap peaks and valleys of demand during the daily or weekly cycles that you would see when normal industrial things are happening. Uh, nuclear power is still very competitive on a base load source. 
uh, of electricity, and that's continuing to operate. But I think more than anything else, uh, what you've watched over the last year and a half, uh, particularly in the United States with the Section 232 event that was, uh, was spurred there by a couple of the Iranian producers in the U.S., was a delay in demand as people waited both inside the U.S. and outside the U.S., or outside the U.S., excuse me, for the results of that, uh, that report and in in, in that petition to come through. And so people, uh, particularly U.S. utilities, but also outside the U.S. utilities, were waiting to see what's going to happen. And they sort of deferred purchase for the last year when they could. And with the decision sort of out there, but not really yet, uh, we take the add on to this. this so people were whittling way into their inventories. We're seeing about a 38 million pound a year uh, deficit of between primary supply and demand over the last three years. And then you add this 25% uh, thing that Sid was talking about on top of that. And yes, while electricity demand is down, uh, things, utilities are gonna emerge from this post market sometime and they're gonna have to buy the uranium. And the question is where is it gonna come from in the short term to meet their shorter term needs. Uh, and what they've been doing over the last, uh, since the Fukushima event 2011 is being well covered by long-term contracts from the major companies that have now started rolling off a couple of years ago and are pretty much gone. And being able to supplement that with discretionary purchases along the way, well, the long-term contracts are gone and they can't find short-term supply, it's gonna create a bit of a challenge. Um, will, will we see, to, you know, to me, it reminds me of 2005, 2006, all over again. I've been saying that uh, you have utilities who believe that the world's awash in endless uranium, you have suppliers going, well, great, we're going to supply because we have to do what we can to stay alive. But they're now at the point where they can't, and you've seen production curtailed over the last couple of years before this event happened. So uh, post-COVID world, uh, the world, if the world comes back and does what it's supposed to, uh, people start getting back to, to doing what they were doing beforehand, the question will be whether they can pick up that cheap uranium supply. And that's very debatable right now. And I think one interesting thing about uranium is barring some sort of meltdown, it's actually a very safe and clean um, source of power compared to coal, oil, natural gas. You've seen over the last uh, half of 2019, uh, a lot of, uh, of, of environmental advocates and people looking for CO2 reductions to really start to embrace uh, nuclear power as, as one of the one of unnecessary. You know, Mm -hmm. key cog and base load electricity globally. And, and so the acceptance has really been growing before all this uh, COVID started to happen. And I think another interesting thing is you were actually the director of worldwide exploration at Cameco uh, previous to this role. And I think a lot of people are very interested in, do you have any insight? What does it take to shut down a mine? And uh, like, I can't even begin to imagine the complexity involved in such a task. Do you have any insight into that and how fast can they resume production once everything is fine? Oh boy, it really, I am certainly not the expert. I have, I have a very loose knowledge. So I, I would, <laughs> I think there are probably a lot of people who are inside the mining companies who could answer that question a whole lot better than I can. Uh, in, this, in Saskatchewan, they have to keep, uh, in, in places like MacArthur River and Cigar Lake, they have to keep the freezing process going to keep the, to keep things from uh, thawing out. Uh, it probably, you know, to reestablish the supply chain, it's, it's more than just turning on a switch at the, at the plant or at the mine to get it up and running. There's a whole supply chain network there to get it moving. And it's probably, you know, realistically, a three to four week process at best, um, for sure, in Saskatchewan. I think Kazakhstan might be a little bit easier um, because of the, the way the system runs it's a little bit uh, being pumping more water than anything else but you still have to load up your resin so it's not like you turn it on and full production comes out it's still probably a two to three week process to get back up to full speed again uh, at those operate at the the sort of isl Kaz kazakh operations um, because they won't have material in in sort of the pipeline of the whole processing system and they'll have to put rain back on their resins and their resin tanks the recovery tanks uh, to keep that system going uh, same thing in the milling system that would follow up in Canada from Cigar Lake. They would have processed what's in the mill system there and then have to sort of get it back up to speed will take a couple of weeks. So I, I think it's three or four weeks. Uh, in Canada, I think probably the biggest challenge is going to be the community social responsibility or ESG sort of component here. We, we the, 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 the mining companies have done a phenomenal job of 
uh, and, can, and can still do better, but doing a great job integrating the northern communities into the mining operations in terms of employment and in terms of supply chain. Uh, but these northern communities are remote. They have very, very poor health uh, infrastructure that you'd see in southern state uh, in the U.S. or in the, in southern Canada, where you have where most of the population is, and they're more susceptible to to what would happen with COVID. So I think the mining companies, including the exploration company, can be very, very careful about how they reintegrate back into the to the process because the risks to the the, to the communities are are much higher than they would be mm. in other places. So I think there's going to be some caution here before they restart. Uh, I don't sure. I can't speak for Namibia, but I imagine it'd be very similar. Mm -hmm. And we've seen some of those, not in the uranium sector, but in terms of the oil sands, where they had an outbreak at some of those projects. So definitely it's something that everyone should be concerned about. Um, speaking of Cameco, they have a 13%, I believe, interest in your projects, um, which is a, a large vote of confidence. Can you talk a bit about now, uh, introduce some of your projects to the viewers who might not be familiar and uh, what should investors be looking out for in terms of UEX uh, going forward? Okay, well, I like to look at this as the complete portfolio company. So if you're looking at, a, at an investment in the uranium portfolio, you can invest in grassroots companies and you can invest in producers, you can invest in developers and you can invest in discovery companies. And I think what we do is we cover that whole span short of production. Uh, we have two projects that are development ready. Uh, they're just not moving forward because we know the economics at today's prices, even with the 54% increase in the last uh, uh, year or so, is not yet where it needs to be to, to, simulate, to, stir, sorry, to stimulate new production. Uh, so we're going to hold those until the market calls for them. Uh, we have 18 projects, which is a crazy number for a junior uranium mining company. Uh, but we've been around since 2001. We're one of the, the there was Paladin, there was Denison, and there was us. And we picked up a, a, some really great land, both through joint ventures and some staking. And from our, our partner, our original companies, which Cameco was a founding shareholder, uh, they, they contributed some of our key projects that we have, and I'll talk about them, and our Shea Creek projects. But we have a large grassroots portfolio. Um, but what separates us from everybody else is, is that because we have these four flagship projects, we have projects that are, have, you know, we're sitting on literally projects where there's a mineralized hole, hasn't been looked at since 1977. We did that, we did a follow up on that one of those this year. Uh, so one of, these, one of these projects will hold four or five, and in one case, probably 13 or 14 high profile targets that'd be flagship targets from an exploration point of view. The, the key thing in the uranium sector is that producers go up and down with the price, developers go up and down with the price of uranium. And because we have a, almost 100 million pounds in our, in our inventory, uh, we'll go up and down with the price of uranium as well. Uh, but we have this portfolio of lower risk opportunities. And UX went back into the 2000s, we were the, we went from quarter up to almost $9 at one point in time. And we were the market darlings of the uranium space back then in an upswinging market. You saw what Hathor did in a flat market around the Fukushima event. They outperformed all the producers as we did during the upswinging event in, in the early 2000s. And you watch what NextGen has been doing in the last few years in a downwards trending market. Do discoveries always out, outpace on a stock performance basis the producers and developers? And that's what, but the beauty for us is we have that sort of floor of having those resources in our portfolio already mm -hmm. to protect us from the downswings. And what prices do you need um, in order to, as you were saying, at this price, it might not make sense, but at what price do you feel that you need? I, when we, we have our Horseshoe Raven project, you're kind of looking at a break-even price somewhere in the 45 to $48 a pound range. Uh, okay. US, I think if you were to talk to Cameco, where they bring on a project like Millennium, uh, you're looking, they're, they're incentivized price, which means they get the return on investment is somewhere around 60 bucks. Um, and you're looking at they want long-term $45 a pound for MacArthur River, which is sitting idle right now. And I think that's probably realistic. Some of our peer companies have talked about some lower prices, and that's definitely possible. Uh, but under, being under $60 puts you in the low-cost half in, the, in this space, and that's where we want to be. And what about your cobalt projects? Um, cobalt is also a very important uh, metal going forward in terms of electric vehicles. Can you talk a bit about your plans for those assets? 
Yeah, we, 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 when Cobalt was really hot uh, about a couple of years ago, uh, we had a, a sniff of a discovery from 2003, 2004 on our West Bear project. And we said, well, uh, the West Bear, this, this looks pretty interesting by, you know, when we first got it, we sort of said, oh, well, this is a, this is a neat project. We should do something with this, <laughs> kind of laughing. And then we started looking into Cobalt Space and went, oh, this is pretty unique and relatively high grade. Uh, compared to the rest of the world, we should do something with this. So we've gone out and we put together a, a, a resource. We've upgraded that resource a little bit. I'm not sure we've hit critical mass on size there yet, but what we're doing is proving that the Athabasca Basin has cobalt potential. And for years and years and years, cobalt was used to find, actually you would hit a sniff of cobalt and you use it to find uranium. And no one ever thought, well, maybe we should use the cobalt to find cobalt. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. We've got a unique idea of and, and a unique knowledge how to find these things, and we're seeing more of the more and more of these places on our properties and on others that we don't currently own that uh, we could find more of these and turn the Athabasca into a cobalt district. We're currently working on growing West Bar by finding. We, we believe we're we're not quite to the economic threshold yet, but by finding a satellite deposit, we will be. That's our that's our, that's our goal in the neighborhood and build a district play. Uh, our goal was originally to spin this out into a separate entity, and it still is. Uh, we're still looking to find a way to to extract value for the shareholders. Our we are a uranium company. That is our primary focus. It will continue to be our primary focus. Uh, this is an add-on sweetener for our shareholders. And and when the we haven't pulled the trigger on a deal yet because the right opportunity that ensures that current shareholders benefit the most hasn't yet materialized uh, in the current little dip in the cobalt space that we've seen in the last uh, year, year and a half. Uh, but we're comfortable then the cost to hold is very is negligible for us that we can wait to the right time that shareholders receive their value for the risk they've taken and sid you um recently initiated coverage on uex why don't you summarize um your your uh, thesis for this company yeah sure so we initiated coverage on uex back in october of 2019 the share price was about 12 cents uh, right now it's 18 cents our fair value estimate at that point was 45 cents. Um, just to back up a little bit, uh, the main reason why we liked uranium or UEX and why we kind of picked up coverage of the company is not usually be is because we have a long-term bullish outlook on both uranium and cobalt. There are very few companies out there who are exposed to both commodities, as I mentioned earlier. So um, for UEX, the combined resource of all their pro properties, cross indicated and input resource, approximately 100 million pounds. As of today, like today, the junior resource companies in the uranium space are trading at $2.07 per pound. For you. That's a resource. That's how the resources are valued right now. If you apply that multiple to UEX's resource, you're looking at $175 million valuation of the uranium properties, and the current market cap of UEX is just 70 million. So, you know, even at today's price and looking at, you know, the, the huge portfolio that UEX has, I think portfolio is undervalued compared to the peers. And that accounts for no valuation from Cobalt. Uh, going back to the point in Cobalt, Roger mentioned uh, what they have identified so far as a high-grade Cobalt resource. And I can say, give some numbers to that. Uh, the most recent resource that came out, Cobalt grade was about 0.19%. Most of the global cobalt grades deposits have grades of under 0.1%. So you're looking at a high grade discovery there. Uh, now it's just they just have to go out and drill more and make the resource bigger so that the economics. But yeah, in terms of valuation, purely based on what they have on uranium, uh, UX shares look extremely undervalued relative to peers. And Roger, how's the treasury um, at UEX and will you be doing another financing? Um, and, and what's the appetite of investors in terms of uranium? Well, it certainly changed a whole lot in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it went from being, uh, if you were to go back three weeks ago, it was, it was a pretty tough space to be in. Uh, in, in this, always been a tough space since uh, for the last six or seven years for sure. Uh, but certainly people are a lot more interested. We're getting a lot more interest in calls. Uh, on our on our front, uh, we have about uh, 1.6 million in the kitty right now. We have plans to do a little bit of work on our Christie Lake project this year, uh, which we have some flow through money that's going to take care of that. And we're good through the end of the year. Uh, if we want to increase activity in 2021, we'll have to go out to the market, raise a little bit of money. So um, 
we'll see when, uh, when that happens. We're certainly getting a lot of people interested in investing in uranium and UX uh, calls in the last uh, couple of weeks. So uh, we can be opportunistic in our approach. Fantastic. Um, Sid, I'll leave it with you for uh, any closing questions for Roger. I would like to know what Roger thinks about the uranium junior space right now. Do you think a lot of them are cash tight now because the uranium market has been soft for the last many years? Do you oh, think do you think we're gonna you think we're gonna see a lot of juniors or explorers getting back to the market and trying to raise money as quickly as possible? Or you think the investors will start looking at the space after we after the COVID uh, impact from COVID? Uh, I think investors are looking at the space now. Uh, I think the question is whether what you're seeing maybe more of a general investor interest in the space as opposed to sort of resource specialists or uranium specialists that are coming into the space. But they're certainly looking at the names that, that make sense, that expose them to pounds. And I think those companies won't have the challenge. It's the same challenge as raising money as others. Certainly money is tight across the industry um, because it's been downturned for so long and the price has been flat to down for the last couple of years. Uh, going into uh, into the COVID original COVID issues, uranium equities got beaten up really badly in a short period of time, and the ones that have resources such as us uh, have managed to come out the backside of that of that whole process looking a lot better. Uh, I think you might see some of the smaller juniors, the smaller than the market caps, a little smaller than us, struggle to raise a little bit of money because they don't have that resource backing that a, a general investor would be looking for. Okay, that helps. So for uh, viewers, we are working on an updated report on the market as well as UEX right now. So we'll be coming, uh, putting that out in the coming weeks. So uh, take a visit our website to have a look the updated report. Okay, gentlemen, um, thank you very much for joining us today. It was great to learn more about the uranium market. Um, again, uranium spot prices um, year over year basis of 4%, maybe one of the only asset classes out there that are showing positive gains, um, and up 54% since the lows of March. So definitely a lot of people paying attention to the space. Um, thank you again for your time and uh, have a good day.